Hello, folks. It is time for a Bible class. I want to talk to you about some serious stuff here today. And I don't know for sure how uh, how clearly I will get it done. My little thingy is a little off here. Um, I may skip things. I may go around things. But I think the gist of it you'll get. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And it seems to me like uh, I've been starting in 2 Timothy now on Sunday afternoon about uh, uh, four and a half years. I don't know how long this has been going on. But I want to talk to you about some things that um, that we uh, we fly through verses sometimes and we don't catch what the verses are talking about. Uh, that especially the ones that we don't exactly put an emphasis on. Now, uh, I'm going to go to some other places in Scripture that that will also show up. And some of you might that tune this in, uh, whether it be on Facebook or on YouTube later on, or anyone within the sound of my voice, so to speak, you may not like all this. If it doesn't fit your particular doctrinal position, um, it was not my intention to, to irritate you or make you angry. I want to tell you what I believe about what the Scripture says, because I believe that I believe the Scripture. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now I want you to notice the emphasis that Paul is saying to Timothy, whatever I've said to you, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. In other words, Paul didn't tell Timothy things in private. He told it to him with other witnesses. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same, take those things, the same, commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. And that's not to say that Timothy automatically knew who the faithful men were, but you take the, word, the the truth of God's word as was recorded by the Apostle Paul because he was given the, the uh, uh, inspiration to do so. You take those words and you give it to men uh, and, and, the, and people who are, have trusted Christ as their Savior, the members of the church, the body of Christ, and you give it to them and you hope they're faithful. You know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you hope that what you give them from the word of God are those foods that increase the faith of the individual that you're giving it to. And that's what he means by faithful men. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We who do receive these words are to take them out and give them to faithful men. So, well, who are they? I don't know. I don't know who they are. So anyone that comes my way that's the thing I'm supposed to do with the words that Paul gave to me, like Timothy. Now, notice, if you will, in chapter 2, verse 15. This is far less familiar than most people in our circles think it is. Study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, please notice two things. One is what it doesn't say, and another is what it does say. What this verse does not say is, study this once to show thyself approved unto God. You can't do that. If you studied this every day, if this was the central point of your start in study every day for the rest of your life, you would still be practicing this method of study. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We are to study by Rightly dividing the word of truth. Listen to me. We're not talking about rightly dividing the Bible. 
He doesn't say study the Bible to show thyself approved unto God. He says to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Not the word of God. Say, so, well, the word of God is truth. Yes, it is. And if Paul had wanted you to think in terms of the whole word of God here, he would have said that. But he doesn't say that. He's a, he is accounting that people know that the word of God is, is, the, is uh, perfect and, so, and should be studied totally and so forth. You know how I know that? Because he said it in the next chapter. Chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. How much is all scripture? Well, it'd be Genesis uh, all, all the way to Revelation. Genesis to Revelation? Yes. All scripture. So he doesn't say rightly dividing the word of God. He says rightly dividing the word of truth. Now here's the deal. That passage shows up elsewhere in your Bible. So I want us to look at them. The other places... That, right, that the word of truth shows up. Turn, if you will, to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And folks, I'm going to move kind of fast. It's a lot of scripture. But Psalm 119, and it's the longest uh, uh, psalm and the longest chapter in your Bible, and it's uh, 176 verses of words connected to what is the worth of God's word? I'm not kidding you. Just pay close attention. You'll see it. Um, verse 41. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. Salvation according to thy word. Keep reading. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed, and I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. My hands also will I lift up thy commandments, uh, up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. How are you working on the rest of that verse? Take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, the psalmist begs the Lord. Keep the word of truth in my mouth. Okay, then there's some things about the word of truth. If we practice rightly dividing the word of truth, then there are things about the word of truth that this psalmist held very dear to him, and he said it had everything to do with him keeping the law. Proving his worthiness to the Lord, if you will. I So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. I will walk at liberty. Is that, do you, do you look at liberty as though you're walking according to the law? I doubt that. Now, turn, if you will, to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, I don't mean 2 Corinthians, I mean James. Turn to James chapter 1. James 1. James, right after Hebrews, we get lost somewhere, folks. James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, the verse that I'm looking for here is in is James uh, 1, 18. Oops, I better get to James 1. That's why I couldn't find it. I was looking right there on the page, right there, but, but I, was, I was in Hebrews. James chapter 1, verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Begat has to do with birthing. It does have to do with birthing, begat. Of his, the father, look at verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I want you to think about something. Do you think about James, verse 1, says James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. 
Do you think about James as being words written to you or to those scattered 12 tribes? Which, which way do you look at that? That being the case then, look again at this phrase. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Do you believe that the, that the people like James, James and the people like him, like I, I believe, you don't have to believe this either, and just uh, most theologians disagree with this. I believe this was James who was slain in Acts chapter 12 who wrote this book. Therefore, I believe this was the first book of the New Testament written. But nevertheless, that's just what I believe. I can't prove one way or the other. It just seems like it's him as he goes through the things that he says, not like James, the Lord's brother. And, it, and he says here in James 1, he says in verse um, 13, he says, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Well, that sounds a little bit like there's not any particular uh, element of so-called eternal security there, does it? Look in chapter 2, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And he goes on. He looks at, at, um, at faith. He says, uh, so speak, verse 12, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works can faith save him if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food and one of you say unto them depart in peace be ye warm and filled notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body what doth that profit uh, even so faith if it hath not works is dead being alone look down at verse 24 you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only do you believe this was written to you I doubt if you do. I doubt if there's anyone listening to this who believes that. Okay, then let's go on to the word of truth a little further. Look now, if you will, in 2 Corinthians, like, and look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And this, uh, this, this, this um, uh, passage ought to just shake you. It ought to make you nervous, grit your teeth, those kinds of things. You know why? Because the apostle Paul is serious. Verse one, we then as workers together with him, that's God almighty in God's plan, doing God's plan. He, God hath made him Christ to be sin for us. That's the, that's the hymn. He, God hath made him to be sin for us. Then he says in chapter six, verse one, we then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain, verse three, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. And I'm going to come back to that spot in just a moment. Right now, I want you to go back and read that parentheses that I skipped in verse two. For he saith, I've heard thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is that the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Let me tell you something about God's word. God's word. God's word is a timeline. And God's word is set for a day. In other words, a day that's going on and on and on as we live and, and breathe in this uh, atmosphere. And that day right there is the day of salvation. Paul said it was. He said, now is the day of salvation. When did you read that? You read that right now. You've got your Bible open right now. Now is the day of salvation. The reason I want you to get that through your head is because it's now. It's not about whether or not you agree with somebody 100 years ago or somebody that's yet to come on the scene and write a brand new book or any such thing as that. It's right here and right now is the day of salvation. Now, notice how this works out. If you are going to, 
work. We then as workers together with him. You're working together with God here, folks. You're not working together with me or some other preacher. You're not starting your own thing. You've got God's word in your hands and you're working with God. And now, right now is when you work. Now look, if you will, in the middle of verse four, but all things proving your, ourselves as ministers of God. Now watch, in much patience, in affliction, that is in uh, uh, accompanying, the word in stressed out would be accompanying, accompanying much patience and so forth. In much patience, in, affli in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. Now watch. By pureness, with the use of. By is with the use of. By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth. The word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Keep reading. By the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. Now watch. As, and that's in the manner of, as deceivers and yet true as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Did you see that long list there? And in the right smack dab in the middle of it is the phrase by the word of truth. Dearly beloved, you pick up this Bible and you start talking to people about it, you should know how to practice rightly dividing the word of truth or you're going to not only fail yourself in practice, you're going to fail the Lord whom you are working with. Okay. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study. Well, you ain't done. I don't care how far you've gone. I don't know how many you carry, how many years you've been at it. I don't care what you saw one time made you throw off your uh, denominational uh, shackles and come out amongst all these rightly dividing folks. I don't care what got you to where you are. You ain't done. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth is an ongoing thing. Never quit. Never say I've got it now. You'll probably find something tomorrow in scripture you forgot about. <laughs> Folks, people will do strange things to get a foothold on a congregation or an audience. And they do them. Now I want to talk to you about a couple of them. There's a thing going around by stout hearty men. And they say that Paul, during the book of Acts, preached exactly the same thing that Peter did. That's not true. I want you to listen to me very carefully. When the book of Acts was being, was going on, when the time frame of the book of Acts was happening, it was from at the end of the 40 days that the Lord uh, spent teaching the 12 apostles. It was from the end of that until Acts 28, where Paul said the word of, of this salvation is sent to the Gentiles and that they will hear. It. Now, that's the time frame. I don't care if you say it was 35 years, 31 years. I don't care. That's the time frame. Now, during that time frame, you have several things at issue because it's describing, are you ready for this? I know this will come as a shock to you. It's describing the acts 
of the apostles. Well, those apostles start with the 12, and they were all there. Turn, if you will, in Acts chapter 6. There are a certain number of people who really think, they really do think that Paul should have been the 12th apostle. So we'll just get rid of that one right now. In Acts chapter 6, this man Saul, he hasn't shown up yet. He's nowhere around. And it says here in Acts chapter 6, verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them. Then there were twelve apostles there. That will be the eleven, the twelve minus Judas Iscariot, plus Matthias. It says in chapter 2, go back to chapter 2. Uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 26. They gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven. If he's numbered with the eleven, how many is that? That's 12. Chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, that would be the twelve, were all with one accord in one place. And uh, verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I believe that's the twelve, because the context of the pronouns doesn't change from chapter 1, verse 26. No reason to add that other 108 people there. Nevertheless, they were there in chapter 6. They were there all that time, and it was 12 apostles. It was not a mistake to make Matthias the 12th apostle. It was not possible. It's not possible for Paul to be the 12th. Now that then leads me to the next big deal. It is not possible. I heard, I read what a man wrote. He said it was impossible for the body of Christ to start in Acts chapter 9. He did. He said that in writing. He said it was impossible for the body of Christ to start with Paul in Acts chapter 9. That's what he said. And I'm telling you, it was impossible for Paul to be the 12th apostle. I got just as much uh, use out of the word impossible as he did. Now I look back in Matthew and look in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12. I want you to know something about the about Matthew chapter 12. It's a phenomenally powerful chapter. It really is. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, probably a great significance in that number. I'm not really sure. Um, it has it, it has in it. Um, uh, wait just a second here. It has 50 verses in it. 50. Another one of those numbers that just keeps showing up amongst Jewish people. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus is still in the, uh, in the context of Matthew 3 through uh, here. He is with all of Israel. He has chosen the 12 apostles, and he is with all of Israel all of the time here. Okay, Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hundred and began to pluck the, the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was in hundred and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread? which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only the for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. You know who he's talking about, don't you? He's talking about himself. Greater than the, than the temple. When you get to Hebrews chapter 3, you can see why I said that he's called the great apostle and great high, and, and high priest of the Jews' profession. Okay, let's go on. Same chapter. Look, if you will, in verse uh, 38. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And he, but he answered and, and, and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to, a, to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, 
So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Talking about himself. Is he a greater prophet than Jonah? Yep. Two reasons. One is when he's, uh, when Jonah went to the whale's belly for three days and three nights, he come back out, went out and preached to Nineveh, and then he died again. He died again. Hmm. Jesus didn't die again. He went into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights and come out of it and did not die again. Now, here's the other thing about this. When Jesus Christ prophesied, he meant it, it was clear, and it was foretelling what he was going to obey, as well as what he was going to do. I want you to notice two or three things. One here in this chapter, in Matthew chapter 12, notice in verse 31. You probably knew I was going here. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So then I got to do something here. I know here, this guy over here, I know that he blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And if you say he didn't, you don't know, you either don't know the meaning of the word blasphemy or you don't pay any attention to scripture. He blasphemed the Holy Spirit four or five times between Acts chapter, the end of Acts chapter seven and the start of Acts chapter nine. And if you think he didn't, you should reread what he did, dear friends. In Matthew, I mean, in Acts chapter four, the thousands of people who were then following the 12 all received the Holy Ghost. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Barnabas was one of them. And it seems as you get on to reading later on that Barnabas knew Saul quite well. And Saul was not a friend of Barnabas's when he was trying to kill people that believed in Jesus in Acts chapter uh, 7, 8, and 9. What do you think being filled with the Holy Spirit is worth? Bless your soul, somebody blasphemes against the Holy Ghost. They can't be forgiven in this world. And they can't be, be forgiven in this world over here. Now, if you don't try anything else, try to get Paul to preach the same thing Peter preached with that truth being there. Good grief. See why this is such a maddening thing that somebody should say that Paul preached the same thing Peter did because they read a verse of scripture where he said he said none other things other than Moses and the prophet said should come. Bless your soul. Why do you think he said what he said in Romans 16? We'll be back there in a minute. He blasphemed the Holy Spirit and yet he was forgiven. Jesus said right there, he couldn't, there's two places he can't be forgiven. He can't get into this world, and he can't get into that world. He's not forgiven there. So Jesus changed his mind. And if he changed his mind, then he wasn't Jesus Christ. You're in Matthew 12. He's, greatest, he's greater than any priest. He's greater than any prophet. And he's, we didn't read it, but he's greater than any king right in this chapter. And if he's not telling the truth there in verse 31 and 32, then you've got another, you've got another factor you're going to have to deal with before you preach his name again. So what did he say? What does he say? Notice Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, he says this. It's a parable. He says in verse 33, he's talking to the chief priests and the elders of the people, according to verse 23. In verse 33, he starts his parable. And when he finishes his parable, 
he uh, he says uh, that it, it, I just have to read it. Sorry, got to read it. Verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it, built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent his serv other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They'll reverence my son. But when the husbandman saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. You do know he is talking about himself there, don't you? He's the son. Verse 40. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? That would be, he's asking this question, of uh, verse 23, the chief priests and the elders of the people. They, verse 41, they say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said unto them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I, Jesus Christ, unto you, chief priests and elders of the people, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Are you kidding me? This thing right here is registered in the mind of Jesus Christ right there in that passage as the kingdom of God. And he saw the corruption of it. The kingdom of God was in the hands of those people who had been killing everybody who had the truth. And he said, the kingdom of God is taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Look in Luke chapter 12, Luke 12. And you think you may think you know where I'm going and what this says, but don't fail to go here with me. What if I read it wrong? Wouldn't like that, would you? Luke chapter 12, he's talking to his disciples according to verse 22. Now look, if you will, in verse um, 29. And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things... Uh, do the nations of the world seek after? And your father knoweth that you have need of these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God. The same one he was taken away from these people? Uh-huh. But seek ye the kingdom of God. Uh, and all these things shall be added unto you. Verse 32, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom you, he's talking to the, his disciples, and he gave them, the disciples now have the kingdom of God. It's theirs. Turn to Matthew chapter uh, 19. Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, a young man wanted to know how to have eternal life. The Lord, Lord Jesus told him how to have life. You read that and you'll see what I mean. Uh, then after, the, after this young man let, walked away, uh, verse 25, when his disciples heard it, they were exceeding, uh, amaz exceedingly amazed uh, and saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you sh ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon the twelve throne on twelve thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, I know that they were given the kingdom of God according to Luke chapter 12, and I know that that's a place that that guy Saul can't go to, so it's got to be a, a place right over here somewhere in the future because Saul couldn't get forgiven here, and he couldn't get forgiven over here. So look in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. Revelation 20. 
Verse 1, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. Now, this is the start of that thousand-year reign of Christ, verse uh, 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had his mark, had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand. Lived and what? They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years expired, Satan's let it come out. Now look over in chapter 21. Verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like a stone most precious, uh, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels names written thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, the east three gates, the north three gates, the south three gates, west three gates, verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Go back to chapter 1. Revelation 1, verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are beyond, before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and have made us kings and priests. Do you see how that matches the book of Matthew? Well, then quit trying to tell me that the 12 apostles and the apostle Paul, who was a blasphemer of the Holy Ghost, were preaching the same gospel. Go back to the book of Acts and look at Acts 13. Acts 13. People say, well, they both preached the blood of Jesus. They sure did. They, people say, well, the 12 knew about the forgiveness of sins because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, they sure did. But they never preached it like this. Acts chapter 13, in a synagogue, in a Gentile country, Paul is preaching, and he says here, verse 38, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, reference to Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. No, nobody ever said that before like that. He didn't say, what Peter said in Acts chapter 2. He didn't say what Peter said at Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10. He said, through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses, and nobody preached that. And you know how I know? Because that's not the only place he proves it like that. Look in Romans chapter 16. Romans was written about Acts chapter 20. You can take that uh, uh, any way you want to take it. It looks like that to me. It looks Most everybody says that. I don't know if we're right or not, but you got another idea. Let me know what it is. But it was written sometime during the book of Acts to a bunch of people that he wrote to while in the book of Acts. Probably Acts chapter 20. Read with me in chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. What did Paul preach 
that was like the 12 apostles preaching. Well, there was preaching Jesus Christ. He was the Christ. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, just like Peter said, proving that Jesus was Christ, the book of Acts said. There was the pureness of his blood, the worthiness of his blood as a sacrifice for sin. They preached, both of them preached that. Both of them preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter never preached a mystery that was revealed to Paul, kept secret since the world began, though, in your Bible. I don't know what he did with the rest of his life, folks. I wouldn't argue with anybody about that. That's like arguing with a signpost. My daddy used to tell me I could do that. But I do know I can't find it in Scripture. People say, oh, you're misreading. You're not going to. I know the context of preaching a mystery, the revelation of a mystery kept secret since the world began. Am I really supposed to believe that Peter and John knew all about this? you got to be kidding me. Get off your high horse and start reading all the scripture. I get accused of not using all the scripture. I could have gone several places in the Old Testament here if y'all would stay on here for another hour and a half. You see, my point about all this, folks, is I've listened to people preach all my life. I've listened to dozens of denominational preachers. I've listened to dozens of rightly dividers and wrongly dividers. I've listened to people come up with the truth and then walk right straight away from it. I got a friend that got saved because he trusted Christ one night, and now he's preaching and baptizing people and getting them to take water baptism and the Lord's Supper as the ordinances for the church. Where does he get a thing like that? He don't get that out of Paul's epistles, does he? No, he doesn't. I've got friends who have talked to me many times about what they believe in the scripture, and now they're saying things like, oh, well, all the prophecies have already been fulfilled. Well, you didn't study Daniel very well then, did you? Neither did you study Daniel, Nehemiah, uh, Zechariah, or Revelation. Because when you do that, you know that all the prophecy hasn't been fulfilled. People say, well, you're just stretching that out. You're just trying to make that a different picture. Why don't you just believe what it says? Just believe what it says. That's all. Don't try to do something else with it. Just believe it. Now, when Paul said this, the, the man that wrote that long article, and I hope he's a friend of mine. I hope he's a friend of mine tomorrow. I, I'm, I'm criticizing him because I think he's wrong. But he can do whatever he wants to do. I'll do whatever I want to do, but I don't hate the guy or not mad at him. Or, no, I don't doubt his salvation or any such thing as that. But he said it was not possible for the body of Christ to have been there in the book of Acts. Well, he can't read real well. Look back in Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, written Acts chapter 20. In Romans 12, verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. People say, well, that's not the body of Christ. Oh, well, in that case, look at a book he wrote before he wrote Romans, 1 Corinthians, and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Oh, how about that? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Huh. Verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Where does this guy get off saying that the body of Christ wasn't in the book of Acts? Can't he read? Evidently not. Now if he calls me up, I hope we can laugh about that. But I'm not kidding about the truth of it. So Paul, he, he said Paul couldn't have been first in the body of Christ. Then he, he, he did say it's impossible for the body of Christ to be in the book of Acts. But that's not true either. Because after all, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And some of you say, oh, I know what he's going to read. Well, of course you do. Because it's a truth. It's an accepted truth. What are we supposed to be doing here? We're supposed to be rightly dividing the word of truth. Keep reading. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. That'd be Paul. The word M-Y, that's Paul. 
Verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Apostle Jesus, that's him. My trust. Glorious gospel, which was committed to my trust. Verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, ta-da, and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, the reason I know that that's true, that he was chief, is because he blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Well, I suspect before I was, I got saved at age 22, and I suspect before uh, age 22, the night that I got saved, I suspect I blasphemed the Holy Spirit, don't you? I imagine you did too. What's the difference? If How could Paul be chief if we all did the same thing? Because Paul did it when it was for sure going to shut him out of anything the Lord had offered. Let me say that again. I'm going to whisper like Joe does. Pay close attention. No, I'm not. Listen, the kingdom of God was taken from the hands of the people ruling over Israel and given to the 12 apostles called the little flock. And it's a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So what, there, what was here becomes a nation over here, bringing forth the fruits of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God's theirs. It's right over there. Paul can't have it. He can't. Jesus said he couldn't. You can't change Jesus' mind at all. But when Jesus showed him something, he showed him something that the 12 didn't know anything about and didn't know about it until they read Paul's writing about it. If you think I'm wrong, just back up a couple of places. Hold on to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and look back at 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Can you find anywhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or the first part, first 12 chapters of the book of Acts, where anybody thought that was going to happen to them? Well, can you? No, you can't. You know why? Because nobody knew it was going to happen until the Lord told Paul it was going to happen. And he said it in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, real clearly. Behold, I show you a mystery. Oh, another mystery? Yes, another mystery. The 12 didn't know it until they saw what Paul wrote about it. That isn't all. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says this, verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He's the chief of sinners because of the blasphemy and he could not get saved by these methods or in these places, but he could get saved by what the Lord gave him. Read the next verse. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Oh, as in Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39, when he was preaching something that the 12 never did preach, through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Read James chapter 2 again. Come on. This isn't difficult. Let things that are different be different. Things that are different are not alike. Do you ever notice that? I'm sure you did. Now, one more thing. We've read five of the places about the word of truth. You probably know where this is going, right? Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says in verse 12, 
that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. And if you used Paul and you knew when you knew who Jesus Christ was talking to you from heaven, you knew that there was a, there was that the day of reckoning was there. And you knew you couldn't do anything. And when, when Saul on the ground said, what will thou have me to do, Lord? It didn't make any difference how Luke recorded all the events. The end result is that he filled up the sufferings of Christ according to Colossians chapter 1. And he wrote 13 books in your Bible. And all of it differs from the doctrine of the 12 apostles everywhere you go in those 13 books, ladies and gentlemen. Things that are different are not alike. Now notice this, verse 12, that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, comma, the gospel of your salvation, colon, the word of truth to you and I, study to show thyself proved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, the word of truth is the gospel of our salvation to you and I. That's not what James was talking about. That's not what the guy in the psalmist was, talk was talking about. That's not what they were talking about. That's what Paul was talking about. When he said rightly dividing the word of truth, he's wants you to see your gospel. The gospel that saved you. It's how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. And by the way, I don't know whether anybody yelled and screamed back there when I read Romans 16, verse 25 and verse 26, but I can show you the gospel of Christ content in the Old Testament. And when Paul preached it and put it upon himself, he was obeying the Lord. The 12 apostles would not have known what to do with that because they were taught differently. Why? Because those 12 apostles are going to come over here and they're going to be ruling the nations from their 12 thrones out of this city, this pyramidal city that's coming down. And we read about in Revelation 21 and uh, 20 and 21. It's also in part of 22. And if you read that, you can see that's here during the thousand year reign because there's dogs outside and vicious people outside and on and on and on. That's not where you're going. You should be very glad about that. The Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout, takes you out of here. Ready to go? How about if you trust Christ as your Savior? And if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, but you like the sound of some of the other doctrine that I've been sort of yelling about here, why don't you just read your Bible? Study it. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And don't let up on rightly dividing. You won't get done tomorrow. I thank you for being here. Appreciate it very much. I hope that uh, you have a great day and that uh, uh, nothing else gets in your way after this Bible class is over. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. We'll stop the recording here. See you.